Hello and welcome back to Polytoots. In this video we are actually going to do the texturing now and uh, unlike all of the previous videos that I've done uh, I'm going to start this one off with a bit of um, real-time recording so so I'm actually here now I'm actually doing that and the reason that I'm doing this is I just want to kind of set some things up and to let you know what will happen because uh, there's going to be a fair few instances where I'll be speeding through some things um, so I'm just going to let you know you know roughly kind of what my what my workflow will be uh, and if you remember from the the end of the last video i did not bake the ambient occlusion and the reason that i haven't done that is because uh, i do actually want to add in some more normal map information here um, so if i were to just come up here and enable the other uh, normal stuff and i'll just create a new layer here i'll just call this like normals extra and what this means is uh, if I turn off my symmetry, because this is actually a unique piece. If I were to just come along and start adding in, that's a bit weird, uh, adding in some normal maps, that's really weird. Is it because, oh yeah, no, uh, <laughs> this is this is why I don't like to record in real time. Um, make sure that your Vox tree layers are hidden because it's really really annoying like if i were to go into some other room and then come back into the paint room this would be re-enabled which is really annoying um but anyway so if i were to you know just start doing some normal map stuff obviously i'm gonna do uh, a little bit better than this if i were to bake my ambient occlusion now so i'll just go and do that by coming up here and going to calculate occlusion and i'll leave everything as default um, it will put it into a new layer so if i just do this You can see what's happened here. If I just change my ambient inclusion to a standard layer, so we're only looking at the ambient inclusion. I'll press the two key as well, so we're not looking at any lighting information. It has it has actually generated ambient inclusion for those normals that we've just made. So if you're ever wanting to add in extra normal map information to your mesh, uh, you might want to hold off on doing your ambient occlusion bake too soon because um, you'll probably have to just redo the bake later anyway. Um, and the reason that it's Kind of important for us to ignore the ambient occlusion for now is if i just set this back to multiply but we also want to do a thing where we're going to bake the occlusion in two parts because at the moment uh, although it's not the end of the world but uh, if i were to just hide my lid you can see here that of course because the lid was on the object i baked the ambient occlusion and there's just no light in here so it wasn't able to to generate any of that so you'd probably want to do your ambient occlusion bake in two passes if I just come back to the lit mode by pressing the 5 key. Uh, for now I will also get rid of my normals extra. Yeah, so what I mean by that is if I were to just hide my lid and then do another bake, you can see that it has actually uh, lit the inside here. And now similarly, if I were to bring only my lid in and then do another bake, and then we'll unhide everything, we come over here and we, we see that we actually have two ambient occlusion layers now and it's okay to merge these down so i'll just hit the uh, the merge button down here and if i just stick that into standard blend press the two key uh you can see we have you know i mean there are some issues to fix uh we can have a uh, nice ambient occlusion where we still keep the inside you know not being pitch black uh so yeah that's that's pretty cool uh but i will just get rid of my ambient occlusion for now because uh, i will be adding in some extra normal map information the other thing that, that I wanted to cover, and I mentioned this in the uh, the previous video, I was saying that I'm not really going to use any of the layers that I have here. Like this is mostly just uh, color and spec information. Um, if I just come back into color now, the reason that I still have them here is it allows me to uh, essentially isolate selections without having to uh, deal with any sort of split mesh. So as an example, the front plate of this lid uh, it is actually part of the same mesh so you know if i were to be a bit lazy with my texturing which i often am during the uh, first pass you know it's just sort of like rough strokes and i need to uh i need to just make a new layer so i'll just make a new layer here and uh actually, i didn't want to make it there so i should put this up at the top because if it's underneath all these other layers then it will uh it will be hidden by those layers so i'll just stick that at the top for now uh, and if i were to just start painting uh, you can see that because this is actually the same mesh, it's very easy to accidentally paint on it. Whereas um, 
you know, I probably want this to be different color entirely. And so that's why I still have these layers here, because what I can actually do is I can come down to the front plate lid here. I can right click it and then say freeze transparent pixels, which will basically invert the selection of this. So if I were to say freeze painted pixels, if I just do that, it will freeze that actual selection. Uh, if I hit control D to come out of that and then freeze transparent pixels. So now that will freeze everything else. So I can come up to, you know, my layer and I can just start painting away and I don't have to worry about it painting any part of the mesh that I don't want it to. You know, I can just, just do that, uh, making sure I get everything and then control D to come out of it. And there we are. See, so it's uh, nice and tidy. So that's why I still keep these layers, but uh, I will mostly be texturing myself uh, on top. And then as I move along, I'll just be removing the layers that I don't need anymore. So at the end of it, I end up with only my new layers. So I'll just remove that for now. And the last thing uh, that I wanted to cover in real time before I switch back to the, the old format of just talking over what I'm doing, I'm gonna go into my custom folder here and you can make your own folders by just hitting this little icon here. I'm going to be doing a bit with uh, Smart Materials just, just to give myself a bit of a head start with this uh, comic book style. So I'll just hit new. And so this will basically, it will create a Smart Material for us. And so um, I'll just call this one, let's say, uh, Comic Lines. And I will change the color to something pretty dark. You can also here, if you set it to modulate, then this color will actually just use whatever color you're using, but uh, make sure to set the color to white. So, I mean, if that's a bit confusing, um, if you set it to modulate, but then you have the default color as uh, a dark one, uh, what will happen is it will try to use your color, but it will modulate it over the color you specified. So if you actually put this as a pure white, now it will actually use your color because it's just, it's just white. Um, but anyway, I'm just going to go with replace and I'll just use a dark one. And for this, uh, pretty, pretty simple. Uh, for here, the degree, uh, you can see that it's set to always, so it will cover everything. Uh, whereas I want it to be more on convex only. And it will calculate a uh, curvature map, which is fine. And so once it's pumped out your curvature map, it does kick you out of the material editor, which is pretty lame. So you just have to right click it and then go to smart material editor. So yeah, we can see here that we do have our condition working over here. And then we, we can just like play with this. So you, you know, you, you can, you, you can make it stronger. Um, you can increase the contrast or decrease the contrast. Um, but also if you didn't want it to kind of always appear in a straight line, like for example, if we just have a look at it, it's quite annoying because if I hover over, then the preview disappears. So um, hopefully future me will edit uh, an arrow or something just to show that, you know, where it's basically a full line. If you didn't want that, you can actually just come over to the condition mask texture. And if I just right click here, it will open up this window and I can enable this checkbox to apply some procedural noise. And uh, annoyingly, you can't move this window. So um, I'm going to have to have to. And now I'll come back and I'll just right click again on this area. So you can see that my line has been broken up a bit. And if I were to change, you know, the noise scale, it gets broken up even more. For the most part, I'm probably not going to use this noise too much, uh, but I just wanted to show you there because um, it's pretty cool. Um, a lot of stuff can be done with it, but I'm just going to hit save on this for now. Uh, I will tweak it later, but, um, but you know, I don't want you to have to sit through me trying to find the values that I like, and I'll probably use different values for different pieces anyway, so uh, it's all good. So yeah, if I were to just, uh, let's just say use the fill tool, and I'll just cover this whole layer with this. So it's pretty strong, so that definitely needs some tweaking. Uh, I'll just close this. Um, but you can see how it kind of acts as uh, an interesting starting point. Uh, as I say, it is definitely way too strong for me. But I mean, that's pretty much it for starting um, or rather just preparing to start. Um, and so from this point onward, uh, let me actually just get rid of this. And I'm also going to get rid of the curvature because similar to the ambient occlusion, um, I, I do believe at least when we paint in extra normal map information, uh, when we do the curvature bake as well as the ambient occlusion, it will take our new normal information into account. So uh, yeah, that's another thing that I will I will do after I mess with my normals. So. Yeah, I'm going to swap over now to the to the standard format. So I'm just going to texture away and try to forget that I'm doing a tutorial, I suppose, you know, just try to relax and basically try to make this thing look as pretty as possible.
Okay, so first of all, I'm just going to open up the color swatches window, which you can find in the other uh, window menu, I guess. And I'm also going to assign a reference image that I have. And this, uh, I believe, is from the original artist. So uh, I'll be sure to put a link in the description if if I still have it. I'm doing this just to essentially find my um, my base colors. And right off the bat, I don't like the muddiness of the original, which, which is strange, I suppose, because when you look at the whole thing, it kind of makes sense. And you recognize that as the, uh, the red Borderlands loot box. Uh, but I wanted to go with something a little bit more saturated. Just I just wanted to use stronger colors all around, really. And so most of what you're seeing here uh, is basically just trying to find my base colors and then adding them to the swatches list, which is completely optional. I find with these things, the um, the further along that you are with the texturing, the less you rely on on the swatches anyway, because you just you just tend to grab the colors from an area that you've already textured anyway. But uh, as as a base, it kind of makes sense. Uh, and you may see here like a lot of instances where I'm just freezing selections. Hopefully you watched the first like nine minutes or whatever it was of this video. So that isn't too confusing. I realize the sheer speed of this probably isn't overly helpful, but um, I think in total it's taken me about four hours to texture and there's no way I'm going to upload a, like a four hour long real time tutorial. It's just, it's just going to put everybody to sleep. And I do find with texturing, it's uh, it's a difficult thing to teach. You know, it's not as easy as when you're doing sculpts and things where, um, I mean, obviously not, not all sculpts, hashtag. But you know what I mean? For the most part, it's very easy to, to teach um, technical workflows or a pipeline of sorts, or even, you know, you should use this tool to do that. And this tool does the same thing, but with different results, yada, yada, yada. But with texturing, it's, um, you know, like the most technical part of texturing, I suppose, is kind of how you organize your layers. You know, if you kind of pre-think some things out so you know that you want some things to be separated from other things, you know, it's like like that's that's pretty much it. And the rest is basically just a, a good old fashioned brush, basically. And um, of course, the use of stencils and smart materials as well. I will try to um, to pause the video at certain points or perhaps bring it back to 100% uh, speed if I cover anything that um, that I feel, you know, is not not particularly easy to uh, pick up on whilst watching it in this like massive sped up time lapse. I think on average, what you're looking at is about 300% speed increase. I should probably mention that um, I do use the E key quite a lot to change my brush type. Like before you saw me just painting on those faces and now you see me doing this uh, like line stroke type thing um, and essentially you can change your brush mode with the E key so if you see this thing pop up every now and again it's because I'm pressing the letter E on my keyboard if you've assigned it to something else then um, it does exist over there in the top left corner just above the other uh, two colors so yeah I'll just leave uh, leave myself to do the uh, the base colors now and I'll, uh, I'll pipe back up again whenever there's something of note that's worth mentioning. I will just let this play out. Like I, I won't won't actually cut anything out. It'll it'll all just be sped up. And yeah, I'll be back whenever there's something worth talking about. Okay, so one thing that I do here that I haven't explained is I've just hit Control P on my keyboard, uh, and that basically will open up all my layers in an external editor. And for me, it just happens to be Photoshop. I don't know if Photoshop is 
detected automatically or if you have to set it within 3D Coat itself. Uh, but either way, up in the edit menu of the other uh, paint room inside 3D Coat, this is where you'll find um, something to do with uh, either projecting to an external editor or opening layers in an external editor. But it's a pretty cool feature and it basically just allows you to open up, you know, your current texture file as it is now with all the layers in whatever external 2D e editor that you use, uh, which just makes little operations like this a bit easier because um, while it might actually be possible inside 3D Coat, uh, I don't know of an easy way to do it. So um, I, I will just do little things like this here. And then you just have to save the, the file and then go back into 3D Coat. You don't have to worry about losing this file or anything. This isn't actually like the final texture sheet. It's like it is okay to close this file and not know where it exists. So long as you save your changes and then go back into 3D Coat, it will update there in 3D Coat. And so yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it. I'm just um, adding in those black lines, which I will use as a selection inside 3D Coat. And then I am just tidying up some bits here and there where, uh, where the colors just aren't making a whole lot of sense. Um, but in a second, I should go back into 3D Coat yeah, here. So we can see that I have this now and I'm not going to use this layer for the other uh, blackness. I'm only going to use it for the selection. And I'm going to go and if you see up the top here, I've changed the drawing mode to be the normal map only. So I'm not painting with diffuse. I'm not painting the spec. I'm only doing normal map. And I'm just using that selection from that layer I just made. And I'm just basically creating an, an, a normal map from that. And now from here, I am doing my ambient occlusion bakes, uh, but that was actually a mistake because uh, I did completely forget that I also have to do the uh, the grating normal maps on the um, flipper objects that are situated behind this chest in this scene. So yeah, I think I also do my curvature here as well, um, which is yeah, pretty pretty lame. As you can see now, like I'm cleaning this up, but I have to bake the ambient occlusion and the curvature again afterwards anyway. So uh, don't do what I did and just make sure that you bake your AO and your curvature when you are actually finished with your normal maps. I mean, it's not the end of the world, but you know, it is kind of annoying. So even though I completely disregard this curvature map, uh, you can see me here actually painting some more white areas into it. Um, and this, I haven't actually checked to see if this works yet, but when you use smart materials, it uses your ambient occlusion and your curvature to work out you know, what details need to go where when you're using condition masks. And so presumably in the same way that we can manipulate a normal map or a, an ambient occlusion and just, you know, actually paint our own information in, I think the same thing applies for a curvature map. So I just added in some extra highlights so that it would actually catch it in the smart material. And I've been rambling for too long and now on screen I'm doing smart material. So yeah, this is the bit where I'm actually doing the, uh, the comic outline thing. Um, and so I just fill in that into a whole new layer just on its own and then just tidy it up afterwards for the bits where, you know, it was a bit too strong in some areas and then it's a bit too light in others. And so I do, um, I mean, spoiler alert, I do eventually go through and manually add in some more outlines. Um, yeah, so here I am in Photoshop again. And so for this one, I am actually putting in the metal outskirts for this um, flippy outy thing. And then also I go back here to add in the, uh, the grating. And so then it's after this that I actually have to redo the ambient occlusion and the curvature.
Oh, and yeah, right there is a little weird glitch, but if you just hide and unhide some layers, uh, it seems to fix itself. I'm not sure what the deal is with that, but you know, whatever. And so again, just kind of tidying up the outline smart material because you know it's just it's just a bit strong in some areas so um, yeah no need for that and for this i'm not using the eraser tool i am just holding down the control key which is similar but um not entirely the same which um, i will get to later on with something that i completely forgot I suppose technically the things that I'm doing now still counts toward me um, filling in my base colors and I find that's usually the way with me when it comes to texturing like um, as nice as it would be to have some sort of methodical approach where you do you know 100% of everything and then move on to something else and then something else I, I find with texturing there's a lot of uh, back and forth where you'll mostly do something and then you'll move on to something else and then go back and forth and back and forth and yada yada yada. So from here, again, just using that trick to isolate a layer by selecting the invert and specifying that you want that to be frozen. I'm just removing the edges. And again, I'm just um, using the selection to, uh, to paint in some normal maps. And this is what I was saying about the control not being the same. I'm holding control here to try and remove that normal map, um, but it's actually carving into it. Um, and it turns out that what I actually needed to do was just use the eraser tool instead. There we go, nice and clean. And so yeah, I guess it's probably about here that I realize I need to rebake the AO and curvature, which is, you know, annoying, but my fault. So it is what it is. So you can see here that now I have this problem again that I need to fix. And I figure this one's gonna be easier to do inside Photoshop. So once again, hitting Control P to go in there. And I'm just gonna make some selections and just basically try to cover up that absolute mess. So yeah, from here, I am just manually removing information from uh, one ambient occlusion layer so that I can merge it in with another because when I did the, the bake again, I had all of the objects there. And so now, you know, I have extra ambient occlusion layers and uh, there's no point in me completely disregarding the previous one I baked. So I'm just removing the clippers from the first one I baked and then I removed the, the base and the lid from the second one I baked and then I merged them back down.
And then, yeah, unfortunately, same again with the curvature. So the exact same thing, just drop it into Photoshop. And I'll just make a selection. I think I just duplicate it and then I play with the curves and then just use like some sort of soft selective erase just to um, merge it back in a bit. Bada bing, bada boom. So there we go. That's, uh, I think at least that's, that's my mistakes fixed. Oh, I still need to, yeah, of course, remove the, uh, the flippers from the original. So this of course means that, um, I didn't actually lose any of the, um, the manual curvature painting that I did before because I still kept my original one and I just merged it with this new one, which is why I'm erasing bits from both layers. Um, I apologize if this is confusing. I think even if I were to try and explain it in real time, it would be as equally confusing. Uh, yeah, I'm just tidying up some layers here, just things that uh, I no longer need or I didn't actually ever need from the start. Just basically removing some of those original bake layers and tidying things up a bit. Uh, and now I am just coming in with the same color as the outline and then also on the same layer. Uh, and I'm just adding in my own like manual outlines here and there. Uh, and I believe for this, I'm actually using the steady stroke option, which you can find up in the, uh, the top left-ish menu, which is pretty cool. Like I think if you, um, if you've seen or used the, uh, like this lazy Nazumi or something like that, it's some sort of uh, plugin, which is for Photoshop and also other things. Um, but basically one of its main features is this um, steady stroke type thing. So you, you, you can kind of draw smooth lines because the actual brush is just kind of um, trailing behind your point on a mouse. It's a little weird to get used to, but it kind of works quite well. Oh, and here, uh, if you hit the C key, you can actually use a drop down menu to, uh, to change the, uh, the brush mode in that you can tell it to choose a random color between the two colors that you have in your selection or just to randomly choose one of the two colors you have in your selection and I find it's a really nice way just to add in a bit of uh, I mean for want of a better word a bit of texture to your texture and so that's what I'm doing now just going around and um, using similar tones some highs and lows and just giving it a, a bit of a once over just to add in like a tiny bit of variance so it's not all a flat color And then back to the outlines. Not too much to say about this. I'll probably just stop talking, I think. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Oh, actually, one little uh, tip, I suppose. If you wanted to, to have these outlines just be automatically generated with a smart material, then all you would have to do is, I mean, you'd still have to uh, do some amount of work. So, you know, sorry about that. But if you created normal maps of where you wanted these outlines to be. So, you know, if you were to use the rectangle marquee tool or something and just place in these areas of just um, like, you know, raised detail. And then of course you would have to do the ambient occlusion and the curvature again so that it actually catches that detail. But then when you use a, a smart material, it would actually include, you know, your new manually painted surfaces in its calculations. And so, you know, you could use that as a viable method for like, uh, I suppose, you know, air quotes, uh, auto generating these outlines, but you know, it's not so, it's not entirely automatic because you still obviously have to have the normals. We could have done this stuff in the sculpt actually, but I didn't want to tie myself to any particular pattern because if I didn't like it by the time I reached the paint room, it would, you know, it would be a bit too late. We could have removed them and then made some others, but yeah, that's just wasted time basically. So, um, this was my compromise, you know, it doesn't take too long just to draw some lines.
I think it's around this point where um, I'm now considering what I'm going to do about my highlights. So you see me kind of uh, mess with a few things and trying different layer styles like overlay and soft light and um, standard. Um, there's, you know, there's there's a fair few opinions that one could have on this. Like if you're definitely doing some kind of reskin where you're changing the color of things and it makes sense for your highlights to be in like an overlay or a soft light layer. That way when you change the color underneath, uh, your highlights will just change accordingly. Uh, although lots of people do not like this approach like at all. Um, I think what I ended up doing was um, a bit of a middle ground, I guess, which probably makes both of them redundant, but that's just classic me. Um, I did go with a soft light layer, but um, I was also using a bit of color to my highlights. Um, the only thing I regret doing at this point is using the same color for the for the reds and the grays. Uh, I probably should have changed up the color of the highlight for the grays, but um, you know, it's not too much of a biggie. Um, and this is just like the first pass of the highlights, I think much later on probably in the uh, the second part of this video um, I will get around to doing the like the um, the super bright highlights that you just kind of want to lay across very thinly here and there just to kind of add in you know a nice bit of uh, high frequency detail I suppose um, so yeah for now this is just like the base highlight stuff Yeah, I mean, I think uh, for this part of the video, at least, that is pretty much it. So uh, there's only a couple minutes left, so I'm just going to let this one play out. Uh, I don't think there's anything anything left in this first part. Uh, I do have the model finished and textured. Um, in fact, so I'll just quickly throw something up on screen now just to prove that I actually have done it. Um, it's just a case now of me editing out the, uh, the next video. Uh, and then we'll be good to kind of export this thing out and drop it into Unity and do all of that nice magical stuff. So yeah, um, I do thank you for watching. I know this has been a bit of a long one and there's not really much to gain from these time lapses. Uh, if there is anything that um, you've seen that needs you know, a good proper explanation just because I've sped over it too fast or something that I didn't even feel like mentioning, then by all means, let me know and I will be sure to um, help you out. So it feels a little bit strange to say this, uh, you know, the uh, goodbye before the video was actually finished, but um, I am going to be quiet now. So um, yeah, I will see you in the next one.